Hello. Welcome to EPG Patshana. Today we are going to talk about the paper Introduction to Linguistics and its module number 9, The Nature of Sentences, Syntax 2. In the previous unit, we laid down the foundation of the field of syntax and how sentences were looked at in the 1950s and onwards. Today, what I am going to talk about would include recursion and idealization. From there on, I will move to competence and performance and how individual variation in it is seen. From there on, the logical prioritization of competence. Then we would see some actual examples of performance. Then the issue of grammaticality versus acceptability would be brought up and we'd look at it using the two phenomena of center embedding and verb particle constructions. From there, we'll start off for the approaches to phrase structure developed in the theory and we'd look at immediate constituents as the first of them. Then we'd move on to the current approaches to phrase structure that was developed and end it with endocentricity as the first principle of the current approach to syntax. Let us begin with recursion. As a beginner student of linguistics, everybody has this doubt in their mind. If a sentence can go on infinitely long and the mechanism of recursion does exist in language, why is it that we don't hear or read a sentence that goes on forever? Well, the answer for this was given by Jean Acheson, whose work was mentioned in the previous unit. And Jean replies by saying that we don't hear or read an infinitely long sentence because in practice we would either fall asleep or we'd get bored or we'd have a sore throat. We also see that language is comparable to number systems in the sense that we can have a generation of infinitely large numbers but practically we use a comparatively very small numbers set in our day-to-day -day usage of numbers. Let us try and see how idealization works in a scientific study. To see this, remember your own Newtonian laws of physics, one of them being that a wheel once set in motion will continue to be in motion forever. But in reality, we know that this law does not hold because the wheel stops because of the reason of friction. Another law was that gravity exerts equal force on all things such that they should fall to earth from a given constant height at the same speed but this does not happen in reality for all the various factors we dealt with in physics the same can hold and it does hold so in linguistics too as the newtonian laws of motion are true in vacuum we say that they are idealizations similarly linguistics talks about ide idealizations too and we understand idealization in linguistics by looking at a quote from Chomsky's 1965 work, Aspects of the Theory of Syntax. I quote Chomsky here when he says, Linguistic theory is concerned primarily with an ideal speaker listener in a completely homogeneous speech community who knows its language perfectly and is unaffected by such grammatically irrelevant conditions such as memory limitations, distractions, shifts of attention and interest, errors, random or characteristic, in applying his knowledge or the language in actual performance. Thus, Chomsky and linguistic aims to characterize the knowledge of an ideal speaker listener. But a person whose knowledge of a language approximates quite nearly to that of an ideal speaker listener may or may not have the social or official status as a native speaker of a language. Let us move on to the concept of competence versus performance. What is competence? Competence is a speaker's knowledge of his or her own language. Linguistic theory takes this internal subject, this internal object as its object of study and this intrinsic knowledge is what is called as competence in all linguistic theories. A linguistic theory does make a claim about the properties of language in human mind. Quoting Chomsky, 1965, a grammar of a language 
purports to be a description of the ideal speaker hearer's intrinsic competence. Well, that was competence. So what's performance? Performance is the application or instantiation of this knowledge of a language in the world. That is, what is heard, spoken, read or written in the world is performance of the language. In his later works, Chomsky separates I language from E language. I language stands for internal language, E language stands for external language and linguistic theories deal with this I language part of the language. Performance is affected by many factors other than competence. All these factors are discussed later in unit number 18 and they won't be dealt with in this module. Because of this competence, a speaker can instinctively know what parts of a speech corpora like a corpora of English speech collected by Randolph Quirk and his team in UK. This will be talked about later in this discourse too. What parts of speech are systematically produced and what parts are due to errors or mistakes like a change of mind, mistakes due to hurry, hesitation, etc. A child acquiring a language must also have similar instinct to judge what parts of linguistic input are systematic versus what parts are because of random or systematic errors in performance. For example, if the linguistic input given to a child includes a lot of stuttering, the child must be able to rule out that stuttering is not part of language, that is, it is not a systematic part of the language he is about to generate. More difficulties in child language acquisition will become later will become evident when we discuss actual speech data from corpora later in this unit. Moving on to the next topic, individual variation and the logical competence and the logical prioritization of competence. When Chomsky was making the distinction between competence and performance, what Chomsky was acknowledging that all biological systems as in physical system have this theory building component of it that talks about idealization which abstracts away from individual variation. In his work Reflections of Language 1975, Chomsky gives this quote, a physical organ, say the heart, may or may, may vary from one person to the next in size and strength, but the basic structure and its function within human physiology they are common to the species. Analogously, two individuals in the same speech community may acquire grammars that differ somewhat in scale and subtlety. Abstraction from individual variation is required in both a theory of heart and a theory of language. Chomsky also makes the fact that individual variation cannot be studied effectively until the object of that variation, the basic phenomenon, is understood in a clear and concise way. The object itself whose variation we want to study, that should be clear before we delve into the variation of it. Thus, the study of competence becomes logically prior to the study of performance because competence is what we have in the core and variations of it may come up in the performance part of it. Now let us look at some examples of actual performance. A corpus of English conversation was developed by Randolph Quirk and his team in the UK. This is a source of spoken material which is used by linguists to be used in grammatical descriptions. Johannesson gave a review of it in 1982 and I give a quote from this which goes like, the book faithfully reproduces the hesitations, repetitions slips of tongue and the anakilutha which characterize spontaneous speech. Now if we try and know what anakilutha means, Webster's 7th Collegiate Dictionary me states anakilutha to be syntactical inconsistency or incoherence within a sentence. Now that you have syntactical inconsistency or incoherence on the table, this implies a direct reference to consistent or coherent syntax. This means that 
grammar brings up the competence versus performance issues here too. In his review, Johansson gives examples from a lot of data of the CEC, which are mentioned on the screen in front of you. Amongst the ungrammatical forms that are mentioned, rung as past tense form, what's to be did about you, themselves have showed, people which I know of historical interested Japanese. All this data is very interesting because you see all of it is put in quotes. What this quote implies is that in the reviewer's opinion, this is ungrammatical because of accident rather than intention. Identification as ungrammatical in quotes requires implicit comparison of the data with of the speech corpora with some grammatical norm. Thus, here again, the distinction between competence and performance comes up where the reviewer is comparing the data given in the CEC with what norm of grammar he knows. This is a common thread for a speaker or a transcriber too. This can be easily stated by saying that transcription of raw speech is intertwined with a choice of interpretation, a choice that arises out of the transcriber's judgment about what is grammatical and what is intended by the speaker based on his own competence or knowledge of the language. For example, in page, five, in page 261 of CEC, a sentence is given that goes like, if academics the right word for a polytechnic teacher. Now the S in academic could be interpreted in three ways. The first one is if we take that S to be the plural S to mean to plurality of the academic. The second way is possessive S and we want to talk about something in possession of the academics. And the third one is the contracted form of verb is which is dropped when we have academics like uh, academics is. So now when the transcriber was transcribing this data, he went with the third possibility because that is what makes the sense syntactically. Here also the transcriber is viewing what makes the best sense according to his own grammatical norm. Let us move on to the next topic that is grammaticality and acceptability. Chomsky 1965 states that competence performance distinction also leads to grammaticality acceptability distinction. Grammar can generate perfectly grammatical sentences, but they can be hard to understand or hard to say even. We look at data from two phenomena for this. First is verb particle construction and the second is center embedded constructions. Let's see what verb particle constructions look like. A verb like call up can have particle up attached to the verb or it can have that particle separated from the verb and being intertwined by the object. To see this, look at the data on your screen, sentence 1 and 2. Sentence 1, I called up the suppliers. In this, the verb and the particle are together. Sentence 2, I called the suppliers up. In this sentence, the object suppliers intertwines between the verb and the particle. Both are equally grammatical and acceptable. And we know that there must be one optional rule that moves the object from the outer edge to between verb and particle in sentence 2. Now let us complicate our situation further and see the sentences 3 and 4 on your screen. Sentence number 3. I called up the suppliers of those fiberglass chairs that we saw in the dentist's office yesterday. Sentence number 4. I called the suppliers of those fiber class chairs that we saw in the dentist's office yesterday up. Sentence 4 feels odd though it is grammatical. The rule of moving the, op of moving the object between the verb and the particle, if it was applicable in sentence 1 and 2, it should have been applicable in sentence 3 and 4 too. Thus, we know that this minimal pair does not distinguish because of that rule. But the problem here is that the object in sentence number 4 is so heavy that it makes it difficult for the listener or rather the mind of the listener to remember 
that the last word up must go with the verb call. So what we saw from this data is that it is the processing constraint in real time that is the problem and not a problem of grammaticality which makes sentence 4 unacceptable. Now let us look at center embedding. In the early days of transformational grammar, much of the psycholinguistic work was done around this phenomenon of center embedding. By center embedding, I mean a sentence like the editor, the newspaper, the authors, liked, hired, died. Difficult to understand. For most people, when they see this sentence, what they see is first three phrases as strings of noun phrases and then three verbs left hanging after them. It's very difficult for them to match what noun phrase goes with what verb. There is no matching of the verb with their subject. Compare this sentence with another, another pair of minimal sentences which are on your screen. The editor that the newspaper hired died. The editor the newspaper hired died. The difference between these two sentences is the word that is not included in the second sentence but is intended to be there. When we are mentally parsing these two sentences, we use the notation of bracketing to understand what verb goes with what subject, so, which is also visible on your screen. So when you see the sentences carefully, that the newspaper hired is one part, the editor died is another. Irrespective of the fact we have that in the second sentence or not, we do get the meaning conveyed. So what's the difficulty when we have one more center embedded structure? See the minimal pair on the screen. The editor, that the newspaper, that the authors, liked, hired, died, versus the editor, the newspapers, the author, liked, hired, died. The structure becomes so much more visible when we use bracketed notation and the word that in the first sentence to understand what event is being talked about here. Comparing these two, we understand that the difficulty arises when we have a sentence which is embedded within a sentence that is further embedded in a subject. One cannot remember three subjects in a row and match them with their appropriate verbs later on. What one can do is that two subjects in a row and two verbs, they can be matched without straining the memory. Moving on to the next topic. Let us begin with approaches to phrase structures and begin that with immediate concepts as a notion. Structuralist error highlighted the fact that sentences have immediate constituents. By immediate constituents, I mean that words, words are grouped together into closer chunks. The most obvious grouping of words that one could understand is that of a subject and a predicate. In NP, is mostly understood as a subject and a predicate is taken to be a VP. For example, in a sentence like all the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty together again. The part bracketed first all the king's horses and all the king's men, all the king's men, that chunk together is the subject of the sentence and is an NP. Could not put Humpty together again, that chunk in another bracketed Notation stands for the predicate of the sentence, which is the VP here. A subject and a predicate could have immediate constituents inside them too. For example, see the bracketing on your screen. We have the king's horses as a more immediate constituent and all outside it. All the king's horses becomes another constituent. Look at the predicate. You have Humpty together again as the most internal immediate constituent. Then you have put outside of it and have put Humpty together again. Then you have could not and you have could not put Humpty together again as one constituent. Now it's a common fact that ambiguities do arise based on how words are grouped together into immediate constituent. For example, when you have old men and women, you could make the grouping in it in two ways. In the first meaning, you could have men and women and then old outside of it. In this, you mean to say that both men and women are old. Or you could have a second immediate constituent notation in it where you have old men and women. 
by this you mean to say that men are old women are not to give another example student council leader when you have student council as one bracket and then leader outside it you me you mean to talk about the leader of the student council whereas if you have student council leader then you are talking about the council leader who happens to be a student thus ambiguities in meaning do come up based on how we are grouping the words inside the chunk into smaller chunks not everything syntactic could be captured by this concept of immediate constituents let us talk about discontinuous dependencies and see the two sentences on the screen sentence 1 if it rains then we won't go sentence 2 either you should come or we should go now when we are talking about discontinuous dependencies you can see that we are linking first element of first immediate constituent with the first element of the second Im immediate constituent even in the second sentence there is a dependency between first element of the first immediate constituent with the first element of the second immediate constituent if then either or immediate constituents are identifiable but they do not express this dependency between such elements thus theory had to be developed further to tackle why this happens just to give you a hint generative grammar later on stated this problem by saying that both of them they are originate at one point but one of them moves out and moves higher up but we won't be delving into this right now another phenomenon that immediate constituent could not capture was that of verb particle constructions if you see the the bracketed notation that is shown on the screen for sentences 1 and 2 you see that though both these sentences mean the same thing but constituents immediate constituents are marked differently sentence 1 they put their papers together in this their papers together is one constituent and put as a verb is outside it whereas sentence 2 they put together their papers in this case put together is one constituent their papers is another constituent thus we have separate constituents separate immediate constituents for two sentences that mean exactly the same thing in the world this was not explainable under the theory for immediate constituents another lacuna that was felt for this immediate constituent theory was how in constructions like below on your screen the word all which is relating to the noun phrase the boys can be split from it but still the meaning remains the same sentence 1 all the boys who gave up their jobs sentence 2 the boys have all given up their jobs thus if we were to make bracketed notation notations for it the bracketing would differentiate where all is located versus where the meaning part of it is coming from from all the data that we saw we conclude that immediate constituent only is confined to a surface view of the sentences and cannot account for a lot of linguistic phenomenon moving on from that to the current approaches to phrase structure phrase structure currently is an area of a lot of linguistic research transformational generative grammar was focused on finding transformations and those transformations were the most important component of grammar for them in the last 50 years attempts have been made to reduce the number of transformations to a set of general principles phrase structure as a concept helps us decode language acquisition by telling us about universality of principles of language to begin with let's see the first principle of the current idea of phrase structure that is endocentricity by endocentricity i mean everything must have a head a phrase is constructed around its this head so if we have to see what possible np's can be constructed with the head boy we have the data on screen the boy the tall boy the two tall boys the two tall boys who are sitting outside these are all possible in noun phrases constructed around the head boy 
if we were to construct the same noun phrases without this head noun, then we'd get impossible constructions like the set, the tall set, the two tall set, the two tall set where you like outside. This same principle of having a compulsory head applies to verb phrases, preposition phrases and so on. Thus, it was deduced that phrases have heads, they are endocentric and these heads project that phrase to the next level. But a problem arose for this principle of endocentricity. What about sentences? Do sentences have heads? And if yes, then what is the head of that sentence? First solution that was given to this problem was that verb is the head of the sentence. Because if there is a predicate, then there is a verb in that. But there were reasons given for which it was discarded. And the later recent solution to this problem was that verbal inflection or tense heads. These are the ones that head the projection of a sentence. For this, sentences were labeled in the later theories as either TPs, standing for tense phrases, or IPs, inflectional phrases. A very important deduction was made from this principle of endocentricity, and that was the child does not have to learn individual phrase structure rules. From universal grammar, the child gets the lexical verbs and nouns into its language, and then it needs to know how a project, a head is projected further up into a noun phrase and a verb phrase to get a sentence actively working in its language faculty. Chomsky 1994 amongst other authors have developed this idea. One important phenomenon that came from endocentricity was the distinction between languages and the placement of their heads. Languages vary whether they place their heads in the beginning or in the end. This led to word order differences between languages. Languages were categorized into two, head initial languages in which the head was placed before other material like complements of that head and head final languages that placed the head after complements etc. To give you an example of a head initial language, we have data from English on the screen. It is prohibited to put the papers on the desk. Head of the verb phrase to put is in the beginning and its complement, the papers and an adjunct on the desk is after it. If you have to see data for a head final language, we have sentence from Hindi on the screen which parallels the meaning of the sentence given for English. Desk per kagas rakhna mana hai. If you see the bracketed notation, Rakhna comes at the end of the constituent. This is the head which is occurring at the final position. Even Manahe, which is heading the full verbal phrase, is coming at the final position of that VP. Thus, Hindi is the head final language. A debate that came up from it was, with, do both these orders, head final and head initial, are they both there in the universal grammar or is there only one universal order? This debate is going on, but one proposal that was influential about theory building in this area was Keynes 1994 anti-symmetry. This was important as it related hierarchical structure with linear order. Now to summarize what has been said in this module so far. We know that competence characterizes a system of linguistic knowledge. This competence idealizes away from actual speech or writing or even individual variation. Performance is not a faithful representation of competence as performance has its own errors built into it along with inconsistencies. And there are problems of interpretation which emerge when we try to transcribe oral speech into a written recorded data. The competence performance distinction led to grammaticality acceptability distinction which was looked into a more deeper way by looking at data for center embedding and verb particle constructions and we discussed the nature of phrase structure by examining the idea of immediate constituents and where it all fails along with the principle of endocentricity. Thank you.